Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. It's nice to see a good crowd here for a special visiting artist that we've flown in for the the, the uh, opportunity for the appearance for the. I'm always nervous when I'm introducing. I've lost my words now. Uh, I wanted to tell a story about Stephen to introduce, and then I'll talk a little bit about his credentials. But um, Stephen is someone that I've, mm, he's a very prolific filmmaker, and he's always at all of the film festivals, either supporting his own films or doing workshops um, uh, along the lines of how he makes his films. And um, I remembered when, we, when I picked him up at the airport yesterday, I was remembering a, a story that's a kind of story about the strange tribal nature of every everything in the world, uh, and it particularly a uh, subculture as small as the animation world, it's strange that it's as tribally divided as it is. Um, but I, uh, the story uh, came to mind when I saw Stephen, and it was 2005 at the Ottawa Animation Festival. And earlier that year, uh, a very well-known independent American animator named Bill Plimpton uh, did, he doesn't like experimental films, and that's, he's, he's, um, he's a kind of entrepreneur of animation, and he makes gag films, and uh, he's, he's, he was a great model for a lot of American independence as just how you own the means of production and the distribution of your films. Um, but he was kind of a bully when it came to uh, experimental or independent uh, or experimental or abstract films. And so he conspired with the director of the NSC International Animation Festival, which is the biggest animation festival in the world, to make a fake uh, abstract film that they then purported to have found lost in an archive and they showed it. And it was a very kind of insulting, disrespectful version of uh, this kind of uh, visual music or direct type of film. And Stephen and a bunch of the experimental tribe were sort of insulted by this, uh, the fact that the director of the biggest animation festival in the world conspired uh, to do this joke. So Stephen asked the director of the Otto International Animation Festival, the second uh, biggest festival in the world, to uh, do a rebuttal um, in, in later in 2005. So the first one was in June and the second one was in October. And I happened to be there and I, I had met Stephen a few years before and we were sitting in the audience together at the opening ceremony waiting for your film which was called Rebuttal. You called your film Rebuttal. And Stephen posed as a film archive in Canada and asked for the iconic Bill Plimpton film, which is called Your Face. He asked for a 16 millimeter print of it, which he in turn then did his uh, pass of uh, direct scratching and um, painting on top of Bill Plimpton's original animation. And that was projected as a, as a rebuttal in animated form to what had occurred previously in France. And Stephen was sitting with great eagerness to see the reaction to this film, but also with a sense of dread because Bill Plimpton, as a bit of a bully, is also a litigious, litigious character. He was worried he was going to get sued for having appropriated this print under false uh, circumstances to do this thing. But after the screening, Bill Plimpton came up to him with his entrepreneurial sense and said, we should distribute this together. And it turns out that you, then at subsequent festivals, you were showing these two films side by side. So it turned out to be uh, what was a kind of productive conversation about this tribal divisiveness and the strange subcultural of animation in animation form. And it, it, to my knowledge, it didn't continue past that point, right? No. But you did, you did have some screening side by side, so it had a happy resolution. Um, but Stephen is, um, in addition to uh, being an animator and carrying on the tradition of uh, what's called direct cinema, and in particular, I think, often visual music, and that you're often animating off of a music track, um, is working in the tradition of people like Len Lai and Norman McLaren, Oscar Fissinger, uh, the early innovators in this, this form. And he's expanded the vocabulary of the techniques that they um, that they sort of uh, innovated um, and has kind of created his own <laughs> world within that genre, uh, created his own vocabulary. Uh, he's, you won a lot of festival awards. His films, I can tell you from my personal experience, his films are always playing in every uh, program in almost any international uh, animation festival. Uh, I think you've made over 50 films to this point. Uh, you've gotten lifetime achievement awards from, uh, the, from René Jodouin and from the Wiesbaden uh, organization in Germany, Austria, Germany. Yeah, you work as a film conservationist as well at the National Film Board of Canada. And Stephen's published two books uh, about the process that he's gonna talk about today. Uh, and you're in the process of also thinking of a third book, right? Um, and so uh, here he is to show you what he does and to show you some of his work, Stephen Woloshin. Well, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, happy International Women's Day. 
Okay, I, I want to just mention that. Um, yeah, it's so interesting that you mentioned uh, Bill because we're on the opposite sides of uh, the, uh, I guess, the art the artistic spectrum you know we have different reasons for making our films but I think the one thing that we share and after knowing Bill for so many years now is that we all share the idea is that we've got to get our films done in the most efficient and easy manner possible and I think that's the theme for today we talk about easy uh, easy because easy means that we have more time to do other things we have more time to, to make other films think about other films or, or do other art that we need to do uh, I remember uh, I developed this whole idea because I, I was also in college. I had to make my films, I had to write papers, I had to do all sorts of things. So, uh, and this actually goes back to high school too because, you know, like you have so little time and you want to look for an easy way to express yourself that maybe other people have kind of like missed along the way. And that's where I'm coming from. Um, and just to say that uh, I think it was about started in high school when I decided that I didn't want to draw and I didn't want to sculpt or, or throw pots or and I didn't want to do anything that was really, yeah, I guess, kind of messy and difficult. So I decided, well, you know, I'm just going to look for the world, just try to find in the world around me the thing that I, I find interesting. And, you know, and I, and I said to myself, well, I like you know, high contrasty looking things. I like, you know, like I like this, this, this big splash of, of stuff. And I said, this was my introduction into the world of easy. And I think we all kind of share that. Does, I mean, is anyone looking for the easy way out sometimes when they're doing their doing the art? Like, you know, like, yeah. Oh, I think I'll scan it instead of draw it. I think I'll take it from the web instead of do it. So easy is a part of all of us. I mean, uh, if you've ever seen Bill Plimpton's films, has anyone ever seen one? Yeah, have you ever noticed that things are starting to, they used to be on twos, what we call them twos, meaning like two frames per, per frame, you know, per, per image. Then they were on fours. Sometimes it looks like now they're on sixes. So people don't move, they move like this, you know. And I say, this is called moving on sixes. And I think that's his way of looking for the easy way to get something done quickly. Am I wrong? Or am I right? Maybe I'm right, I don't know. So like, um, the kind of things I was looking for, I mean, I, I, I know that when I was in high school, I was interested in Mark Rothko, who I was looking, I don't say he was looking for the easy way out, but he was looking for things that we kind of maybe missed. The idea of, of, of simple shapes and simple, simple design, something that, you know, we could really, you know, grasp. Uh, sorry, this is Joseph Albers. Uh, this one is Mark Rothko. So, I, I mean, I'm big f I was a big fan of their work for years, and I said, well, well I really want to do something in a film vein that was simple and direct and something that would just grab us at the most basic level uh, of art, and, you know, because I wanted to be like my heroes here. So, this is the f when I started in public college in 1979, I was shown this film. And uh, this film to me was um, special because I was told it was done with a nail and black leader. And before, and actually while we're going, I, I'm going to put you to work a little bit here. Hang on a sec. All right, so I've just given you two rolls of film, and I, what I'd like you to do with, with the pair of scissors is take about uh, maybe one, two, three, four, five, about eight frames of film, if you can. Cut it off with the scissors, because you won't be able to rip it. And then pass the roll on, and the scissors, and so I want, by the end of this, I want everybody to be owning eight frames of 35 millimeter film, either black liter or clear liter, which you can use for anything that you want. But, uh, but I figure since we have limited time, I want you to be cutting and working and saving film while, while I'm talking, okay? And while we're looking at this. So getting back to what I was talking about, this is a film that really, really turned my head in 1979 called Free Radicals by Len Lai. And keep in mind, it was done on film, a soundtrack, and a nail.
So um, does that film look easy? Doesn't look easy? It looks hard. Yeah, but it is. I mean, when you think about it, if, uh, if the only tool you have around is a hundred feet of film and a nail and a soundtrack that you like, it could be pretty easy. And, and I think that's what really turned my head in 1979. It's just it's like, wow, this is, this is, <laughs> this is easy. I can do this. I've got the film. I've got, I've got hardware. I mean, why not? I mean, so this is where I just, uh, whoops. So this is where I just started, you know, making films um, by myself, uh, usually at home, usually on the kitchen table, because that's, you know, what Len Lai seems to be doing, you know, and, and I think there is probably a lot of other experimental filmmakers that were doing the same thing, working simply and working easy and just expressing themselves with no real um, relationship to what's going on in the world or what's popular or what will get you a job. I mean, now Len Lai is in the history books because, you know, he, he has created, I think, the e essence of what an abstract animated film should look like. And I think that was my, I wanted it to be my goal too. So I, uh, you know, so this, I want to welcome you to my little world of handmade direct and absolute cinema, where I think that easy is good. <laughs> um, like um, Tom mentioned, these are the films that I've made over the last uh, 30 odd years. Uh, some of them are not there, but um, I, I wanted to make it a goal in my life to make films that were either scratch or paint or a little bit of both or involving some sort of found footage on 16. I, I really wanted to make uh, sort of an encyclopedia of the kind of things you could do with film. That's my goal. Uh, so if anybody ever asked, well, how can I do this? I'll have an answer. That's my goal. <laughs> um, I believe that what I'm doing, and, and if you're all getting a piece of film with eight frames on it, what I'm trying to do is understand the fundamentals of animation. I mean, before flip books and before programs that allowed you to make things move, it was really important to make things move in your own mind. Uh, to me, looking at a film strip, I've kind of trained my mind to say, okay, eight frames would look like this. And I think it's the same thing when people were looking at um, Maybridge's horses, that you don't, I mean, in this case you see 12 pictures, but in your head, and I'm sure you can do this, you can probably see that horse moving. Yeah, I see. <laughs> it's true, eh? It's simple. I mean, we all know how a horse moves anyway, so it's not like a far stretch to imagine how those 12 pictures would fit together. So it's also the same thing when you're looking at uh, f empty frames of film saying, well, if I create uh, like a bouncing ball on these frames, this is how it will move. So I think we've all got the ability to make things move without having to flip it or to use onion skins or to use all the other tools and tricks that an animator would usually use. And I think it just takes a little bit of training to make something move in our own head. And that's what I trained myself to do over so many years. Um, I believe in this a lot. You know, creating by instinct and accident. Um, I, I think it's really nice that we all like to draw in great detail. I mean, I see a lot of 3D animated uh, films these days, a lot of CGI films that spend a lot of time focusing on the, uh, the detail, make sure the eyelashes and the hair moves like hair and uh, skin looks like skin. But I really believe there's a, a, a sense of freedom in using the accident. Like when you spill ink, I mean, some people's ma made it their life's goal to take that spilt ink and turn it into, into art. And uh, so I believe that really, really sincerely. Um, so what I do to create those accidents is like Len Lai, I paint and scratch on film. Um, I really believe in synchronizing um, jazz and other forms of music into art. I mean, a lot of people I think know this as the iTunes visualizer. Has ever, anyone ever heard of that? Yeah, it's really exciting, but uh, <laughs> but uh, 
it, I, I guess that's, if someone doesn't understand what I'm talking about, I usually look at them and I say, iTunes visualizer, can you understand that? And they say, oh yeah. But what I'm trying to do is find my own interpretation to what I love about music. Um, I believe in gluing stuff onto film. Um, this is something that uh, if you're using a lot of digital tools that you know that you've got to bring things into your, into your project to make it work. But because I'm working in an old-fashioned method, literally gluing stuff on top of film is the easiest thing you can do. Uh, I see my kids do it all the time. So. And also contact, uh, contact printing films and scanning films. I also like burying films, but I'll get on, on to that. Um, like you, uh, how many people are making films here? Okay, so what are we doing with them when we're done? We like to post them, get people's feedback, stuff like that. Is that what we're basically doing for film festivals? Hey, who's like wants to submit to film festivals? All right, there's a lot of them out there. So yeah, I, I really believe that um, um, I'm like you, I'm, I'm looking for an audience. I really want somebody to watch what I'm doing. I want to meet people that are also interested in what I'm doing. Um, I like to work in short films because I think they're easy to, to absorb and digest and, and uh, they make a nice little uh, break in a heavy program of narrative short films. Um, I've been submitting to film festivals now since the mid-1980s. And I found that this formula, and I'm call calling it a formula, really does work where people need a break. They can't see 12 sad you know, uh, f films in a row or, or 12 happy films in a row or 12 high-tech films in a row. They need breaks. They, they need diversity. It's like when you walk into a museum, you need to see different things. And that's what makes a museum great, right? It's seeing, different, it's seeing diversity in, in, in one room. And I think this is the niche that I try to carve out for myself. Um, I believe in, the, like I said, like I wrote, I believe in the, uh, the honesty of abstract films. I always want my films to have a, like a bit of a backstory. You may see a dot on the screen, but that dot could be something very personal to me. So I use, I use the, this personal time to talk about what that dot meant or what I was trying to do. I think a film standing alone doesn't tell the whole story, and I think the filmmaker should be out there talking about him or herself too. And, um, and like I said, like you, I, I want to reach people in any way that I can. Uh, thank goodness for social media. I, I've met lots of in very interesting people because of social media. Uh, workshops, I'm a big believer in workshops. And of course, film festivals. Um, this is really the important part for me because um, like uh, Tom mentioned, I work in film conservation and I know that there's a lot of people that are working very digitally. Okay, and we talked about this last night, is that the, all the digital products that we're putting out and all the, all the, all the uh, short films and, and, and samples, they're not going to last very long. And I think that the only thing that really lasts a very long time in this world is the written word. And when I say the written word, I don't expect everyone to be a writer, but it's, it's the, the Q&As that people ask you or how you respond to somebody on the internet, how you describe your own work. Um, it's, it's all the things that go into the backstory of your film that will probably survive longer than the film. And I really believe in writing. I believe in, uh, in uh, participating in blogs and journals so, so people know where you stand on something. Because most likely the written word will long survive anything else that we're doing. You know, I, I believe it. I mean, I work in conservation so I know that the films that we keep last or can, could last up to a thousand years. The digital media has to be replaced every five years, and if there's nobody to do that, then all that digital media is just going to be unreadable. And unless you will it into your, uh, that your kids and your great grandkids are going to have to um, uh, change your hard drives, you know, a lot of our work won't survive. And if anyone says, well, they're working on this and that, well, I just don't really believe that digital work will survive. So writing is important for me. Um, as a result, the first book I wrote 
in 2010 was all about uh, decay of media, uh, decay of film, and how to create interesting looking films by, um, by burying them and making uh, contact prints of them. Uh, basically how to take old stuff and uh, make it interesting. And the book that um, I guess you have here in the library, is it true it's here? And uh, I also want to give you another copy here today if anybody wants, and now you're going to have two copies. Um, and I really suggest go to the library and read it because it's, um, it's, it's not an academic book. It's a manual of everything I believe that we could do to make handmade films. It's, it has a lot of solutions to digitizing them and to, and to printing them. So if you get a chance, please check out the book. Um, I wanted to, I'll just talk really briefly about the fundamental techniques of what I do. Um, I like to scratch on film, like the film you just saw by Len Lai. So these are the tools that I would use to create a film that looked like that. And that was actually done with a power saw, by the way. I put, I put the film on my hand, I took like a power sander, I think, and I just ran it up like that. And it's really quite interesting, and it's in the book. Um, yeah, so uh, simple tools that you can buy anywhere, simple film that you can, you know, just use. I also believe in painting on film, and these are the tools I use to paint on, and that's, that's me drawing on a frame of film. Uh, paint, ink, markers, all the stuff that you would find at, let's say, Walmart, let's say, or in your kids, uh, oh, <laughs> I'd say your kids, if you have a, a younger, <laughs> forget the, if you have a younger brother or sister and they're using like markers and whatnot, it's, it's easily, it becomes an easy tool for a handmade filmmaker. And also pop. Uh, the frame I have here is not a frame I've done. It's a frame by an uh, American filmmaker called Stan Brackage. Has anybody heard of him? Okay, Stan Brackage, what he did was made an entire film with, out of the, mo the wings of moths and leaves. And what he did was that he glued it directly onto 16 millimeter film and made an optical print of it. And the reason why is that he wanted to use the projector to bring life to death. And when you pull leaves and moths apart, you basically killed them. But the projector, he believed, would bring them back to life, projected life. So I, I really admire the work of Stan Brackage, and I think just to have the, the audacity to glue things onto film and to say this is a film, I, I think that that took a lot of guts. And, and, I, and I really believe that, you know, like uh, I've done workshops where people were gluing leaves and flowers onto films, and I think it's really quite brave to try to take film and go one step further and look around you and try to say, hey, this could be a film. Um, as you probably now know, because you're all holding film, okay? So a frame to me is very, very small. And this gets back to the idea we were talking about, the happy accident. You know, it's, it's a small little uh, postage stamp. You can't really control the, the image. I mean, you think you can. You know, you, you can obviously stay between the, the edges of the frame. It's really a, a kind of a collaboration between uh, what you can do and what the film wants you to do to it. So this is a frame that, I, that this is about the right size. That's just about the right size. So uh, that's how I see one frame of film. But to you, I mean, sitting in a big cinema, like we talked about Annecy, which is a 2,000 seat auditorium, that frame is huge. So all those accidents, you can't avoid having them. So why not capitalize on them? And that has always been my theory. Capitalize on your mistakes rather than trying to eliminate them. I know in the CG world we do, we work in all sorts of ways to, to try to make everything come out perfectly, like I was saying before. But in handmade cinema, you've really, really got to um, make the best use of the things that you can't control. I mean, you, in a way, you're kind of like a participant at the same time as, as a, uh, you're kind of like a viewer and a participant at the same time. Um, I'm just going to go really quickly through some of the people that I really liked. And you raise your hand if you, or say, yeah, I know that guy. So does anyone hear of Norman McLaren? Ah, okay. All right, he's worth checking out. He's, uh, he worked, I think his, his handmade period was from the 1930s to the 1960s. And at that point he moved on to other, uh, uh, other aspects of animation. 
Begon Del Care, one of my favorite films. Yours too? Yeah. Me too. Yeah. yeah what, a, what a coincidence. <laughs> Color Box, another film by Len Lai. Um, he, I, to my mind, he was the one of the originators of the handmade film. I know that he met McLaren in the 1930s. They both worked at the British GPO postal unit in uh, England. They met, they met there. And I think at the time when they met, McLaren was doing documentaries. And, he, and that's when Color Box came out. So I think he had an effect on McLaren's uh, uh, future output. I love color box. It's always available. You can always find it on YouTube. Not a great version, but it's there. Um, I'm a big fan of, oh, yes, okay, um, a Warner Brothers cartoons, because I like the idea of music and movement. So I'm still a big fan of Chuck Jones. Uh, I don't know if, has anybody seen this film? Yeah, I know you have. Anybody else? This is like the Italian Fantasia, if you ask me. Uh, it's kind of rude, it's rude in Italian, but it's really, really interesting the way uh, characterization is set to music. Um, the, the, uh, this part called the, uh, the Il Bolero section is one of my favorites. Um, so if you ever, f and I know it's also online, so you can just find it. It's super good. It's really worth checking out. Uh, to the experimental side, yes, Mothlight, uh, the film I was just talking to about Brackage, very, very interesting. Um, also, uh, I think Bill Morrison, w did he ever come here? Did he ever? Tonight, tonight, he, this weekend, he's actually going to be here Saturday. He's going to be here Saturday? Tomorrow night and Saturday to speak. Really? Hmm, interesting. <laughs> you got to go check this guy out. I mean, he's basically finding films in, uh, like, damaged, destroyed films in archives. And what he's doing is not doing what most of us or think we should be doing with films, is to restore them. He's not restoring anything. He's showing you as he found them. And, and what he wants you to, to see is a different kind of beauty that exists in damage. And sometimes the, the, the mix between the content and the context of damage is really, you know, like it's, it's really quite stunning. I mean, this is what we would call how, you know, like uh, the happy accident and time all come together to make for a very, very profound statement. Uh, I'll let Bill Morrison tell you more about himself, but uh, <laughs> I'm a big fan of this guy. Okay, art, a big fan of Paul Klee, in addition to the other uh, um, painters you saw. Kandinsky, Pollock. Um, I think that when I look at these, this art, I, I think music. I don't know about you, but I think I, th I can see the movement, even though it's not moving. They're, they're favorites of mine. Okay, so now I'm going to get on to a new part. I'm going to show you a film that I completed uh, last year, about a year and a half ago, actually, called Casino. It's been doing really well. It's a hand-painted film. It exists, uh, it's been going to a lot of festivals a lot of festivals. Right now it's touring uh, most of North America with um, the animation show of shows. Uh, has, has anybody heard of the animation show of shows? Ah, oh, yeah. So you know like uh, Deer Basketball is that one? It is in that show. Uh, the Burden is in that show. So Ron Diamond from Acme Filmworks put this thing together. If it comes to your town, please check it out. Okay, because Casino is in it. And what I want to talk to you is how I made it, okay? So this is the practical side. But yet, um, it's the first time I've really used a little bit of digital help to try to make a handmade film. So the picture you see there is every th physical thing I used to make this film. There was ink, there was a nib, there were optical slides, and 35 millimeter film, okay? Uh, that picture represents every physical thing I use to make casino. Okay, um, the very simple things. Uh, I think up in the exhibit, uh, frame by frame, uh, there in a glass box, there is an example of that ink and the pen and the roll of film that I used. So if you're going, if you if you go upstairs and check it out, there's a, so you can actually see it in 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 real life. Um, now the backstory. It's not immediately obvious when you see the film. When I, you know, like this is where the filmmaker has to, I believe, uh, come into the picture and say, "Okay, uh, this is what influenced me." This is not something that's obvious in the film, but 
This is why the filmmaker, I think, has to be part of the, the equation. That's why Q&As, writing about film, uh, doing press conferences, blogs, this is why the writing and the speaking is so important in what you do. So it, you won't see it in the film, but I'm explaining to you now that I was influenced by a lot of things for the color, Las Vegas. Uh, if, you, if you've ever been to Las Vegas or any casino, you know, the color schemes are very, very uh, nauseating. A uh, little garish, you know, a little simple. Uh, some primaries, secondary colors all thrown together in, in a really disgusting way. Um, another reference that really interested me was a film called Hen Hop by Norman McLaren that goes back to, I think, 1941, 42. Uh, Hen Hop is called a handmade film. Uh, meaning that uh, we all assume that Norman McLaren took a nib and, and ink and made that film. And I say to myself, after working at the film board for so many years, how is it possible that he made such an even coat of orange? And how is it so possible that he made that blue? I mean, this is not a hand-painted look. And also a drop shadow, I mean, like an offset. How, how does he do that? You can't do that with a nib. It's technically impossible. And then when I researched the film, I realized this guy, what he did was that he optically uh, changed the black and white film into colors. He used the black and white as a mask and changed the, the, uh, the background, the clear background and so on. And he also, the film shrank a little bit. So what happened was the, the, the masks didn't quite match up. And what you end up with is the offset. So I said, well, I can't, I don't have an optical printer, so I'm gonna try to do that digitally. So that's what I did. So here are the tools that I use to make the film. Uh, that's something, I don't know if you've any, have, has anybody ever seen a synchronizer? Ex anybody? Besides you. <laughs> okay, a synchronizer used to be a very, very important tool in cinema. Uh, it was the most important uh, film uh, tool for synchronizing uh, what we call dailies or rushes. On one side, where you see the little arrow on the line, that's where the uh, assistant editor would take the, the soundtrack. And on the other side, where you see the, the painterly looking thing, that's where he would take the work print and he would uh, basically um, synchronize the sound and the image together so we could show it to the director. So what I did was I turned this thing kind of on its side where I would st start with a finished soundtrack. And what I would do is I would paint like that image over there shows you, I would paint frame by frame alongside that soundtrack. So if you can imagine a magnetic soundtrack within, with going into a pair of earphones where I'd be kind of like whoop, 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 tweaking it back and forth, listening for the, the beats, listening to where the drum would, would come in or the saxophone or a, a piano. And what I would do is I would draw where I thought, well, basically what I thought a piano would look like or what a drum would look like. And I combined this all together to make Casino. Uh, I'm gonna give you an example now, a 30 second example of what it actually was, okay? It's a film that um, I made at home. And this is, when I brought it to the lab for scanning, this is exactly what the film looked like. So you see what I'm doing? Okay, I'm listening. I like the sound of the piano. Okay, so I think things should change with the piano. I got a, a, little, a little bottle of black ink and I have my clear leader film. And I said, okay, things should move here. Uh, this sounds like a, you know, like a, like a one-armed bandit. Okay, so this is what I did for 300 feet of film. I made it completely in black and white. Uh, at that point, what we did was, okay, this is not the actual black and white image, but just give you an example. Okay, so we took that. Do you, I guess you all have heard of After Effects. Yeah. 
<laughs> okay, I see more hand, uh, more nodding than than a synchronizer. That's good. So, so what we did was, I, uh, me and a friend, we took that file and we put it into uh, After Effects, M remembering it's a black and white image, and I'm sure you see, you can see by what I'm, I'm I'm doing here is how we created. Uh, how we how we're going to now create and, and change the background layers and the foreground layers, where we, we turn the black into green, and we turn the background into orange, and 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 when you're asking yourself where did I get these these colors, do you remember at the beginning I had those like little optical slides, remember like uh, on 35 millimeter squares, what I did was I scanned each of those slides on eight sides and I basically created what we call like a cycle, so. If one, so if you imagine one slide, one, two, three, four, and then flip it over, and then one, two, three, four. So what you're seeing is a cycle of eight, but things, colors change so quickly, you're not keeping up with it. So it's just like you're, it moves, it, it, by the time you've, you realize that it's a cycle, you say, okay, it's not, you know, like, oh, wait, maybe it's not a cycle. So this is what, Okay, and then finally what we did was we kind of pushed one side, one, one, for one, um, what, what do you call it, uh, one, one layer, but also one uh, channel, we, moving one channel over another and creating that offset. Okay, and then we end up with this. <laughs> Uh, so that worked for me. <laughs> so you see what I'm doing here is that, yes, it's a handmade film, but like McLaren, I wanted to do something that involved a different sort of technology. Not because, uh, uh, not because I, I really relished working in After Effects, but I wanted to create something that I couldn't create by hand. You know, and I said, uh, and I, I, I'm, rather than saying, okay, the, the digital side is my crutch, I, I need to use it, I, I searched around for ways of replicating, um, you know, turning color, and I, I found that digital was the best, the, the best way. So, this is the entire film, if, if you don't mind. It's three minutes long. I created it in 2016. Uh, it was actually made specially because I knew I was going to get the René Jodoin Award. So I said to myself, I want to do a film especially for the Sommet de Cinéma in, in Montreal. And I said, I really, 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 I'm doing this for myself. I'm doing this for my dad, who used to like to gamble. Uh, but it, it was done in a good way. Uh, I, so I said, I want to make something that's personal. I want to involve the technology that I know. But I also want to go one step further with a technology I don't know. So this is Casino from, okay, so is it, okay, from 2016. It took about six, uh, it took about four months to make, by the way.
Okay. Oh, what was I going to say? Oh, okay. Well, before I move on, is there any questions about how I made it or anything about it? Uh, did you do keyframing or straightforward? I, well, since I was drawing on film, and you have a piece of film right there, right? Because uh, every frame is put on a synchronizer, like basically the roll is put on a synchronizer, there, can no be, there can't be any keyframing. So what I have to do is I have to do one frame at a time, one after the other after the other until the song ends. And that's the only way to do a hand-painted film. You can't double up on anything. If there's 5,000 frames to make a film, you've got to use 5,000 frames. So you can't repeat things. You can't, you know, cut and paste things. Well, like, possibly, did you, like, maybe draw one here and then one there and then do the in-between? You could. Yeah, I mean, you could. I mean, I mean the thing is, uh, sometimes, I, since I didn't have a plan, I didn't care where I went. Like, for instance, if, if the piano said, okay, if the piano was five frames long, okay, I want the piano to go here, and then and then when the next piano note came in, maybe I want something else to happen. So what I did was I just winged it, as it were, until, <laughs> until, the, until it came to the end. I figured, why not? I mean, I, to my mind, um, making a handmade film is like being a musician with a nib. I mean, if you've ever played, has anyone ever played live on stage? Yeah, I used to be a bass player, so I know that when you're playing live and you make a mistake, you just can't stop and say, sorry, I made a mistake. You just got to keep on moving on. And that's what I do as a handmade filmmaker. I just keep moving on. If I get a fingerprint or if something I, is not good, I can't do anything about it. It's all a part of the ethic of just letting the film be the film and just, you know, trying to survive. Um, I put that there because if you remember the first image, there was something that was pretty unrecognizable. Just the letter A that I zoomed in on. Uh, is there another question about casino or? Ah. Um, did you do any storyboarding or planning before? Though? No. No, no zero. <laughs> I knew I wanted the casino theme, and that's why I showed you at the beginning like what some of the influences were, like the, the casino color, uh, casino-related stuff. Uh, the color scheme was uh, between that and, and Hen Hop. And I said, I'm just going to go. I, kn I knew the music well enough that I rehearsed it in my mind that there was going to be a piano, a fast part, a slow part, and a fast part. So I kind of arranged it like a triptych where there's going to be fast, slow, fast. And that's literally the only planning I ever did. Yeah. Did you listen to I listened to it. What I did was I transferred the music onto magnetic tape, and on the synchronizer and through headphones, I was able to listen to every um, every part of that. Was said that piano note. If if one note took like uh, like that piano run, remember there was a kind of like like a kind of a piano run from top to bottom. I knew that took 12 frames. So I just a question of creating a line that would be 12 frames long. So it would be yeah, it's. It's listening and doing at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> That's the easy. Yep. That. Yeah. That is it. Love music, and 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 rep try to rep you know replicate it as an image. Uh, it's not it's not a hundred percent of my films, but I would say it's about ninety percent. Just like loving what you do and just doing it, you know? Yeah. So, given that process, what sort of criteria do you use to assess what you've done? Like, how do you know this is good, this is not? It's just like when you look at those My Bridge horses, that you got to say, this should be working. And then I scan it and I say, or I'll project it and I'll say, okay, it's working. And that's it. I mean, it's like, I don't know how to put it, but I mean, it's it's like it, this is a part of where a lot of filmmakers, me and a lot of filmmakers differ, and the idea is risk. I mean, risk is not uh, is not a hard thing. Uh, painters know that. People that are like just doing something that they've never done before and then putting it on the wall, they know about risk. And I think a lot of people that are working in a corporate world and or have to go through. Uh, uh, committees or uh, focus groups, even the NFB where I'm working, there's a lot of that as well. It's it's assessing the nature of risk. What's it worth to you? Th to get rejected or not rejected? So the criteria is just put it out there and let somebody else, you know, 
critique it or forget about critique or not worry about critique. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. Well, I mean, because all my films are, are a personal subject, like, regardless if it was or not, it's, it's made for somebody that, you know, that, that raised me. And I said to myself, well, this is, you know, this is, this is the para also the unknown parameter. It's made for, for somebody, and if nobody gets it, well, that, that's okay, you know, but these are the only, it's kind of like a challenge to myself. This is all I'm going to work with. This is all, so all I've got, and this is, uh, I mean, I'm going to show you an example of a film, actually, if we, I think we have a little time, where the parameter is, um, I don't have an idea at all, except the name of the film. So what I did was I, I took the, the name of the film and just expanded it into the film itself. <laughs> and it's just because, you know, I just, you know, like, sometimes I just want to get a piece of music off my chest so badly that if there's an idea there or no idea there, I mean, uh, you know, that's risk. But it's a risk I'm willing to take. I mean, when you really think about it, it's my time. It's not anyone else's money. It's not anybody else's problem. It's my problem. <laughs> so I'll, I'll show it to you. Here, hang on a sec. Let me just get out of this for a sec. Okay. I, uh, I, I finished this one about, uh, did, did you ever see this one? Fiesta Brava? Okay. Yeah, you'll see. You, we'll see if you, uh, you'll tell me, tell me, shake your head yes or no. I thought, oh, yeah. okay. Okay, I mean, let me go for uh, oh, Yes, bloody beach ball. Okay, sorry. Okay. Is it actually playing or not? Ugh. Okay. okay, now it's playing. Thank <laughs> you. 
como acaba Que está brava, que está brava, que está brava Pero no me brava, que está brava, que está brava Todos saben cómo empieza pero no <laughs> so this, this is an example of a film with no idea at all. But, you know, my, I just want to share, I, there's things I love in music and, in, and with the material. Uh, the only thing I've got going is the title of the film, which I'm zooming in on all the letters or just focusing on different parts of the letter and finding translations of the word Fiesta Brava, whatever that could mean, like the big party, uh, the bullfight. And that's just me enjoying. So this is a, an example of no idea, but still, I want to do it. And, so um, I, I wanted to, if I think I have enough time to tell you, I want to tell you about a job that I used to uh, I do. I used to be a driver, you, you know? I guess you all know this. There's a, something out there called the film industry, right? Where there are uh, film sets and actors and directors and, and um, uh, technicians and people who make feature films. Well, I used to be a driver. What I guess the closest you can call it is a teamster. Uh, from 19... Uh, 86 to 2013. So in 2004, I, of course, spent a lot of time behind the wheel of a car, on standby, waiting to pick up actors and directors, making scratch films, and I think you, we even knew each other then. But, you know, like I was only going to festivals when I wasn't working on a film. That, that was the goal. I'm not gonna give up work, but I will go to a festival if I'm not working. So, or, you know, so I would, you know, like, uh, that's my day job. It was for a long time. So uh, what I did was I, um, I said to myself, I've got, I'm, I'm behind the wheel 16 hours a day, seven, six days a week. And I said, I've got to do something, you know, like productive in that time. I just can't drink coffee and do the crossword puzzle. So I said to myself, well, I'm going to start doing my films behind the wheel of the car when I'm on standby. So what I did was... Um, I created a series of little wooden boxes with film in them. And I said to myself that uh, this will be the subject uh, of, uh, you know, I don't care. I'll start, I started one in 2004. I'll only work when I'm behind the wheel. I'll do dope sheets like the way, you know, like uh, the way we used to do them, uh, counting frames. So what I did was I created this little box. I'm going to pass it around so you guys can check it out. It's loaded, it's loaded up with about 50 feet of black leader, which I could scratch, and that's why there's a flashlight and a, a little knife to go along with it. It's hard to get onto airplanes with that, so I've got to usually check the luggage. But uh, it's an example that not only did I want to use, good, use my time well, because 16 hours a day is killer. If you've ever been in one place, if you've ever been uh, done like security guard work or anything, where you've got to be in one place, or if you've got to be a gallery, uh, is, is anyone ever been like a gallery attendant? You know, where you're basically like watching the gallery, making sure that, anyways, I did a lot of, you know, crappy jobs. I clocked a lot of hours behind the Dodge Caravan. And I also wanted to impress on the idea that the passenger in the front seat could be a director, could be a, an actor. And I, and I wanted a dial, I wanted to create a dialogue between what I do and what I call cinema and what they call cinema. So what I would do is I would put that box in the, between the front seat and the passenger seat. I wouldn't use it, but I would, you know, I would have my passenger say, what's that? <laughs> and I said, well, I'm making a film. And they go, uh, no, where's the director? Where's the actors? Where's the hair and makeup department? Where's, you know, like, where's all the things you would need for, to make a film? I said, well, I don't think you need all that to make a film. I think you just need a piece of film. And so it turned into a debate. And the whole idea was to create dialogue with a piece of, with a box. And, and that's what I did for 10 years. I don't have the film here. It's called Mill Plateau. You can probably see it online somewhere. I'm, I'm sure you can. And the whole idea of Mill Plateau, when you translate that, means a thousand film, set, a thousand film sets, because that was made basically 
in the course of 10 years on 1,000 film sets either, where the trailers were or where the set was or the hotel. And the whole point was to make a film in a car and only in a car and what would it look like and this is what I'm going to do and the actors and directors better darn well like it because I'm not going to stop doing it and I don't care what you're going to do. <laughs> so that was the whole point of that film. And, and I made three or four boxes like that and the whole point was to just make well, to, to, to reach two conclusions. One, to make good use of my time and have something at the end of it and to try to promote dialogue to other people and also to so hopefully they'll say, well, I'd love to see this film when it's done. So their, motiv their response was my motivation to keep on working. And I go, yeah, I can't wait to show it to you too. You know? So which I never did because, well, you know, like I didn't feel right about you know, sending my film off to uh, people I didn't know. But hopefully, it, it was a very, uh, a very interesting because I, I found out that so many people who work in the industry went to film school and they did scratch films. Yeah, uh, like the guy who did um, E.T., uh, the, the cinematographer on E.T. started off making scratch films and he was a big fan of Brackage too. So like all these people finding out down the road that they had known something about it. And I even gave them a, a guest shot. I, I said, here, take it the box and draw a little picture if you want. So that's my, that's my story. Um, any other questions while, while we're still here? To make it look smooth, what I would just do is lay the film out in a strip and just run the line straight down it. Uh, with that film strip that you've got, uh, this is what we were talking about earlier, there's a, an app called uh, Stop Motion. Has anybody ever heard of it? Okay. What you can do, what I found, is that you take Stop Motion and there's uh, sometimes you can get an adapter to turn your camera into a, tele into a microscope. Does anyone knows about these? They're like little things I used to buy at a pharmacy, and they're they're little clip-on adapters that turn your camera, your iPhone lens or smartphone lens into a microscope. And what you do is that that microscope is a perfect size for a 35 millimeter frame. So what you do is you open up stop motion, and there's a free version by the way. Photograph it four or five times, and then make your own little GIF. And that's your. By the way, maybe that should be your homework. Make a GIF on 35 millimeter film. Yeah, with this, post it, and then and people are going to say, "My God, how did you do that? What you know, like what program is that?" And you go, "It's 35 film," and then you can, you know. <laughs> I, I'm, I, I had a, I'm wondering if this question also was about what I was wondering, um, just in terms of the question of registration, mm -hmm. like from frame to frame. If you're not, if you're not using a reference behind the the strip of film, um, how do you keep something relatively registered within the frame? It, it, it's eyeballing it. I mean, for a lot of my, my films, I do them on clear leader, which means I'm able to have a reference frame on clear leader and put it behind the frame, draw it, and then let's say put it behind the next frame, draw it slightly different, or draw uh, map out a strategy where it'll let st start at one side and go on the other on, a, on an arc. Or um, sometimes um, uh, when I've done workshops, we put, we've gone through Dragon Frame, which I, w for the people in the, in the workshop, we just open up the, uh, the onion skin uh, option and just line it up with, with the onion skin. Or uh, what people could do is with that same option is line it up with the perforation that are on all f both sides of the 35 millimeter film. So, but also, uh, I mean, yes, how, how does one register? But sometimes it's fun not to. I mean, if you s listen to the music and, and you see that things are jumpy, I mean, that jumpiness is, I think, half the fun of, of, of watching this on a big screen because it just looks so, you know, like so energetic all by itself, if that answers your question. Yeah. So yeah, you can either do it or avoid it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And so I want to ask is like it seems like you are a visual or a translator who translate uh, from audio into something visual and maybe put them together for us to view it. And and I'm wondering about the aesthetic a lot because we talk about clay, we talk about the influence of Rocco, like or or Kandinsky, all the all these great 
great painters that are pre or modernist era. And I'm wondering about this aesthetic that you try to uh, approach, uh, like in, say, like in 2018. And uh, I, I, I know it's like that would come out of love. You know, like yeah. Yeah. Making, but I, I guess I, I also am very willing to know what you see that like you are uh, apart from the personal attachment, but also like the, the value that um, like this aesthetic um, uh, that yeah you still want to keep working with this. So I guess another question. Sorry, the question is too long. So another question is like, <laughs> you know, do you think the work, the reason why your work is working so well because it's sitting in between painting, film, and I think the reason why it's working so well is what you just said, it's that it's out of love. Yeah, sure. And because I know that, um, that Darren and Brackage always talked about what the role of the, a of the amateur was in the world of f film and art. And amateur is a, a Latin word that means to do things out of love, to do it for your family, to do it for your friends. And I think it's because of uh, maybe the love of painting or the love of movement or the love of texture, but it's out of love. And I think you just, you, you put your finger right on it. That's what it is. It's, 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 that's what brings it all together. It's just like, I'm not doing, uh, I'm not reacting to music I don't like. As you can tell, it's only music that I do like, you know, or images that I do like, you know. I hope that kind of answers the question. Yeah. Anyone else? Uh, I think I, I, I once, <laughs> I, I twist it, I actually, no, 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 not at all, no. I actually did a, uh, the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, put out an offer to a bunch of people uh, two years ago saying that um, we are doing this World War II thing. Uh, we would like animators to have one scene of the film and animate to or in their in their way to animate to the the dialogue within that scene and i found that so ridiculous in my mind that what i did was i turned the whole thing upside down and i was i ended up in this like almost practical yelling debate with the cbc about why i think that doing the whole thing backwards would actually be more interesting than doing it forward and they go no 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 and i go yeah but that's me you picked me you you know what i do so would I do something to something that I don't like? I would, uh, but if I could fight back, if, if I could avoid, you know, the, 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 the dogma of what is expected of me, and if I could put my own personal twist on it, yeah, uh, would I do it to, uh, would I do it to Stairway to Heaven? <laughs> yes, if I could run it at, uh, at, at top speed and maybe do it in reverse, sure. <laughs> you know, <laughs> would anyone fight me on it? Yeah, but you know what, even if you do, it'll end up as my film, even if you've rejected it. So, yeah, it would be my <laughs> Stairway to Heaven. Yeah, that's a good one. Anyone know Stairway to Heaven? Don't answer that. Okay. <laughs> I know. Yeah, yeah, I know. I was just wondering, does anyone even bother knowing about that song, except having it call it background noise? <laughs> you know. <laughs> there you go. There you go. You see, focus on, <laughs> you know, fo focus on just the the the, the lyrics. I don't know. If, oh, I don't know. So many ideas there. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Doing like a, a huge like, yeah. symphony mm -hmm. playing behind the orchestra and they were playing Just yeah, I just finished one. I just finished one. But it's uh it's in the hands of the distributor. They're handing it out to Khan or whatever, and they're gonna enter it in a bunch of places. It's twenty six minutes long. It's the music of John twenty six minutes. Well, the, that's the thing, is because uh, it was longer and I wanted something different, I started working with loops and I started working with photograms and decay uh, because I think something longer called for a different tool from the toolbox. It didn't really call for hand painting or scratching, although it did have a bit of that. It called for a little bit of Super 8. So it just means I pulled from uh, another tool from the old analog uh, toolbox. Uh, and it's the music of John Adams. Do you, are you any John Adams fans here? Yeah, so it's from Shaker. It's Shaker Loops. 
basically the entire shaker loop suite as uh, an abstract photogram, but also it found footage from Hollywood uh, trailers that I bought on eBay and making them into loops and then burying them in the ground. So it's all <laughs> Hollywood trailers and shaker loops coming together as something <laughs> else. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll like it. If you ever get, uh, I'll send you a link and, and uh, you guys can check it out. I mean, uh, I don't know who's going to play it first, but we d I do have plans that I, w I do want it performed live. I really would want that. Especially, you know, with the film in the background, you know, in its entirety. Yeah, I want that. Okay, anyone else? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, everything, a lot of the time, I, I do, I mean, since they start off as film, on film, as you have a piece of it now, that can, that is a photo negative, or a lot of my films are, because they, they were uh, black ink on clear leader, they are turned into negatives, and uh, I just did a workshop in Mexico City about a year and a half ago, where we took all these images and basically turned them into photograms. So what we did was we took color images, uh, image pictures, laid it on 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 unprocessed stock, and I have an a another app, which is a basically it's a um, it's a strobe light. And what I did was in the dark was we I ran down the length of the room with the strobe light on, and basically turned our hand painted and our handmade images into a photogram. But a photogram that moved in time. And actually, we use other 35 mil, uh, other photo negatives, you know, stuck on the film, and then photogrammed it again. It was really nice. It's, uh, I think it's still online. It's called the Ghosts of Mexico City, and it's if you if you see it, if you go into Google, it, it's probably hopefully still on my my Vimeo account. <coughs> but it's really special to have 15 people work in the dark to create a, a photogram and then expose it to light and then process it. It's really something. Yeah, I guess you're, uh, if, like you're in photographs, but analog photographs? So you do a lot of processing. So like 35 millimeter black and white is the same width as, th as 35 millimeter uh, still frame, but it's just the orientation is a little different. But what you can still do is still scan it and see it um, as a scan. But yeah, other than the orientation, the film stock is exactly the same. The perforations, I think, are slightly smaller, but it doesn't matter. You know. Yeah. Just a very practical question. Where, where do, what are good sources to get film stock? I mean, is, it, is it still available? I hear that. I hear actually somebody playing Ghosts of Mexico City. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you mean like unexposed film stock? Uh, or exposed, whatever, just, just get your hands People are dumping it left, right, and center on eBay. Trailers too. Uh, there's a lot of short ends going around. Uh, still, Kodak makes stuff. There's people are wanting to get rid of that stuff left, right, and center. It's like it's like, you know, it's like what do what you call it in a monkey's tea party now? It's like anybody can get anything, you know, analog because people just don't know what to do with it. People are giving up the projectors, so they're getting rid of all the stuff that used to play in the projectors, and it's usually on eBay. So it's just like if you want to shop for stuff, now is the time. You know, now is the, and there's still labs out there processing film. There's one in Quebec, there's one in LA, there's a lot of micro labs in Toronto so, and New York. So there's still people doing a lot and actually it's starting to come back. A lot of Super 8, I've done a lot of Super 8 uh, photograms. Super 8 is great. Uh, and there's a lot of people uh, in collectives that are processing, hand, you know, with, with, uh, with hand chemistry. A lot of people that would, you know, would love to, to, to get your, uh, uh, your your work your 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 patronage to like if you give them twenty five bucks or fifty bucks and they'll process what you've done in a collective and I think that'd be great so yeah there's, it's out there and believe me I still shop all the time I found twenty eight millimeter the other day like twenty eight millimeter uh, nitrate it was big in nineteen fourteen and so I found these strips so it's just like it's there 
Oh yeah, and also in Rochester, they're also making stock. Like there's stock making shop uh, classes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, but yeah, there's also b uh, workshops you can do where you can make your own stock with Clear Leader, the guys that travel around from uh, collective to collective, and they show they they share their secrets, just like I sh I want to share. You know, like we, we're all out there sharing because if we don't share it, it's going to disappear whoosh, completely. Uh, and yeah. I've done that a few times. I, I really enjoyed that. I, I worked silently, and what I did was I hired a, a film, um, well, uh, just a sound designer, just to add, uh, like, let's say, I, uh, um, uh, just like, you know, like a, um, uh, an atmospheric music soundtrack. In uh, the film that's playing upstairs called um, uh, National Tapestry, that was sound that was added later. It's kind of a, a, an overall sound, but yeah, that was s image silent and then sound later. So if you go upstairs, you'll actually hear it. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm curious about how you choose what to post on your social media and stuff. Because you're obviously in like film festivals, and a lot of the time they want to be the only people showing yeah. stuff. I think that's changing a lot these days. You know, I think uh, if if you're talking about uh, like Berlin or, or Cannes, yeah, they want to be first to show it. But everybody else, I mean, I've seen stuff online for years and then it wins in Annecy. You know, like uh, there's a quite a few good examples. And I, I don't think, I think the rules are really falling apart about, or, or they're changing, you know. I don't think anyone really cares anymore. I mean, personally, I like to keep stuff off for at least a year just to give people a chance to see it on a big screen. And then maybe a year later, because I know Casino was off, was not anywhere online for over a year. And then it became a Vimeo staff pick. So I said, okay, it's one year, let it, let it be a, a Vimeo staff pick. Which still angers uh, the people doing the animation show of shows, because they said, oh, well, I wish, really wish it wasn't an anime. I want people to come see the film. And I said, well, look, they'll see it anyway, because it's part of, like, Dear Basketball is part of the same show. So they're going to go see that, and they're going to see Casino by accident. So don't worry about it. So <laughs> everybody wins. <laughs> uh, any, any, anything else? Eh? I'm leaving to the airport soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so listen, thanks for showing up, everybody. I really appreciate it today. I have uh, more stuff for you. Uh, if you ever want to contact me because you want to know more, you want to do more, I've got uh, postcards with my email address on it and also my sites and stuff. So I'll be more than happy to share anything with you. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're passing around uh, 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 postcards.